My name is Amanda Hurst. My son is Jackson and he is autistic. Thanks for your time. I appreciate you being here. Uh, describe your child in detail and how autism affects yours and their daily life. Well, Jackson is both very simple and very complex. He is a very, very intelligent little boy. Um, as long as his basic needs are met, he is just fine. But the problems we run into with autism and Jackson having his needs met are communication barriers. And that can take a toll on everyone's day. It's, it's hard to know when he's going to have a hard time expressing a particular need and how long it's going to take to figure out what it is that he's, he's asking for. How old was Jackson when you knew or found out about his autism? Well, we knew from the time Jackson was born that something was different about him. We, of course, at that time did not know that it was autism, but we did know that he was a very different little boy. Um, he, he was not your typical newborn. We brought him home and even the first week that we had Jackson home as a newborn who should have slept, you know, 18 hours a day, he was sleeping maybe four to six hours a day. And so we knew. And, and during his waking hours, he was never, ever calm. He was always um, crying and not just crying, but screaming most of the time. And there was nothing that any doctor could find that was a reason why. Now, later on down the line, at about 14 months old, which is still kind of a young age to discover autism, we saw some behaviors starting to develop and also a very large loss of skills. He had been developing typically and normally all the way up to that point. Um, learned to walk very early. He was walking at almost 10 months old, so he wasn't even 10 months old when he walked yet. He uh, was saying mama and dada, he would kiss when you asked for kisses, all sorts of things that were good signs of typical development. And then at 14 months old, all of those skills were gone and they were replaced with autistic behaviors. Um, we would go to the park and instead of going down the slide, Jackson wanted to pick up handfuls of bark chips and let them fall through his fingers. Um, he didn't want to play with cars at home. He wanted to turn them over and spin their wheels. He wanted to lick the walls. He wanted to lick the table. He would go into fits and tantrums, but not like a typical toddler tantrum. It was something that had no reason. It, he, he wasn't crying because you took away his favorite toy. He was just crying because he was crying and he couldn't tell us anything about why. He would run up to me and bang his head on my knees. Um, when he would hug me, he would bite my shoulder, which I would later learn was a sensory seeking behavior. So we didn't just have one or two signs, we had a lot of signs. How old is Jackson now? He's five years old now. Where did you go to find help? Initially, I went to the internet, um, which sounds like a terrible idea because we all know that Dr. Google will tell you that if you have a headache, you've got a brain tumor. So um, it's definitely not the best idea, I would say, but I did find that I was right and I knew I was right before I even took Jackson to the doctor. I went ahead and, and found the MCHAT form myself, which is the form that you fill out to find out if your child is developing typically. And um, there are these milestones within that form that you're supposed to check off. And if you're missing one of those milestones, it's not a big deal. But if you're missing two or three or say all four of those big milestones, it's a very big deal. And Jackson was missing three out of four of them. And I knew at that moment when I had filled out that form that, um, that he was definitely autistic. And I took him to a pediatrician and they concurred. They said, yes, I do believe you're dealing with autism. And they sent us straight to the um, early intervention services right here in Central Oregon. What are you doing now to help your child in early intervention? Well, we do things at home, um, such as simple things that you wouldn't consider therapy. So Jackson is helping in the kitchen. If I come in and, and we're making pancakes and I ask him to stir the batter, that's teaching him a skill, believe it or not. He's learning to stir. <laughs> and also, he's gaining a little bit of muscle tone because that is something that children with autism often don't have is they're lacking that um, muscle tone that children that age would normally have. Um, you know, we work on 
drawing or coloring because that helps with fine motor skills. But other things very specific to autism would be joint traction and joint compression. We do both of those at home. Um, what about brushing? We don't do brushing with Jackson <clears throat> because he never, um, it never agreed with him. Brushing for Jackson, I think, kind of helped us almost figure out why he was such an upset baby because I really believe that a lot of fabrics um, feel really bad on his skin. I think that he has very sensitive nerve endings and the brushing to him I think feels horrible whereas some other kids maybe they don't feel enough in those nerve endings and so it feels good, it feels necessary, but for Jackson it feels like you know nails running across his skin. What programs are you involved in and who are the teachers? Well, I, I don't know all of their names off the top of my head. Um, I know that Jackson does have a couple favorites. He's currently involved in the um, High Desert ESD, which is the High Desert Education Service District, and he goes to the um, ECSE, or the Early Childhood Special Education class in Redmond. Th that's their branch. It's where he's zoned to go right now with, with where we live. Um, they're, all of those teachers are qualified um, in early childhood intervention, and um, it's it's a good place for him to be. What kind of books or videos or websites have actually helped you with your child? Well, <laughs> that's a difficult question. I've read a lot of books. <laughs> um, I think my favorite book, when it comes to really understanding more, would be the Floor Time book by... Um, Stanley Greenspan, and I've heard from a lot of parents that I've recommended it to that it reads a lot like a textbook, and that's true. But I think you have to look past that and need to look more into the specific cases that they talk about in that book, where you're hearing about this child who, you know, started out at four years old, which is a very, it, it's an older age to start early intervention, and you read about this child who doesn't speak, who does not answer to his name, who sits in a corner all day long because that is all that he feels comfortable doing and they're able to pull that child out of his shell through these techniques. And so I think it gives a lot of hope and a lot of really good advice to parents who might feel very lost. What do you do now to accommodate your child's lifestyle? Like, for example, sleeping aids, um, do you have any calming techniques um, or y any kind of education ideas? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, if we're going to go back to when Jackson was a baby and having sleep issues, um, I would say, you know, he never needed much sleep, ever. That never went away. And we would later learn that that was also an autism um, symptom. And as an infant, he learned how to take apart his crib. That is something that Jackson's very good at, is taking things apart. And at one point, when we finally figured out how to um, child proof the crib so that he couldn't take it apart. We actually coated the slats in olive oil <laughs> so that Jackson's little feet would slide right down and he couldn't climb out anymore. Mm. And that actually got us by for about a year until he figured out how to just sling his leg over the side and, and be done with it. <laughs> He's an escape artist too, um, right? Isn't he? He, is, he is very much an escape artist. We also dealt with that as well, a couple scary instances of that. Um, but later on down the line, we figured out that Jackson felt safer in an enclosed environment. So we actually purchased a two-person camping tent that Jackson slept in in his bedroom for a couple of years. And it was not a scary thing for him. It was not. He, he did not feel trapped. As soon as you zip the tent shut, he would lay down and comfortably go to sleep because that feeling inside the tent offered him a feeling of, of comfort and safety. And he slept well every night. Well, we reached a point recently where the tent was not doing the job anymore. Jackson was no longer feeling fulfilled by that. And so we then had to turn to melatonin. I was quite a skeptic about the melatonin because we had tried it in smaller doses and it didn't, it didn't work, it didn't do anything. And we upped the dose, we tried um, five milligram tablets or, or gel tabs. And what we do is we just pierce the top of the, of the tablet and squeeze it into his mouth. He doesn't care. He doesn't mind. Um, we do that. And one thing I will say, if you want to use melatonin, is make sure that the environment that you 
administer this pill in is conducive to sleep already. So your living room, dim the lights. If you don't can't dim your lights, turn them off and light a candle. Um, make sure that everyone in the house is calm and quiet. Everyone's wearing pajamas. Everyone's comfortable and ready for bed. If you do those things, it's more likely that you will see um, actual progress with the melatonin. We see Jackson go from bouncing off the walls hyper to I'm ready for bed and I'm tired within 30 minutes of administering the melatonin. Um, I have to reiterate the joint compression for therapy at home because uh, that has a calming effect and for typical children joint compression happens every day normally, joint compression and joint traction both by hanging on monkey bars or um, hanging from trees or joint compression happens through running, through jumping, through bouncing on a trampoline but with children with autism either their motor skills are not um, strong enough to perform some of those activities like hanging from a tree, um, Jackson still cannot hang from monkey bars or they're just not coordinated enough and the compression is a form of proprioception which has to do with spatial awareness so you'll oftentimes see a child with autism start to spin in a circle with their arms out wide because they don't know that they're about to run into the chair that's next to them. They don't have the spatial awareness to make that connection. So when you do the joint compression and traction at home, you're helping that child's brain to figure that out when it's an activity they cannot perform on their own and it also offers the calming effect. We do that at bedtime and it really does help him to calm uh, down for bed. Describe a meltdown. And what do you do during those situations? Oh, <laughs> um, well, I sweat a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it depends on where the meltdown is happening, and it depends on what the meltdown is over. Jackson is big on routine. So if you take Jackson to the store one time, and you buy him a treat one time, he will expect it every time. Not because he's greedy, not because he is um, a, a child who is want, 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 but because it's become routine after doing it that one time. That can produce a meltdown. Uh, if you're going to the store and you're not buying a snack or a treat that time, and with other children at home, you can't encourage that kind of behavior. So you are looking at a meltdown. And typically what happens in those cases, I have to handle it the same way I would handle it with, with, typical, with a typical child. We will leave. We will leave the store, um, we will head out to the car, and we will let Jackson uh, get out whatever emotion it is he needs to get out. I always tell him, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be mad. And I reiterate the emotion that he's feeling. You're mad right now, Jackson. You're angry right now. Because he doesn't, he doesn't always know. And he's actually slowly making those connections. As far as what a meltdown will look like, it can look like a lot of things. It can look like Jackson... Falling on the floor, it can look like Jackson picking up the nearest book and ripping pages out of it. It can look like Jackson rushing up to me and, and shoving his body into mine with, with all of his force. It can look like just about anything. And in those moments, he's also sensory seeking. When he's running up to me and he is, is pushing himself into me or he's biting the fabric on his shirt, it's because he has this flush of emotion and he has no idea how to handle it. He has no idea why he feels that way, what's happening, how to cope with it, and so he's using physical means um, to get those feelings out. How do you calm them down? Sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes there is no way to calm him down. If there is a way to calm him down, he will tell me. Um, whether that be very clearly or in a crude manner, but uh, oftentimes he'll come up to me and say, I need a hug. Hmm. And in those times, he does. He needs a hug. Uh, other times, he will not allow me to hug him. I think other times, he doesn't want to calm down. He wants to feel that pain and anger and frustration, and that's okay too. As much as it is taxing on my day, it is all part of his learning process. Have you changed Jackson's food diet? And if so, what have you done? Not a lot. Um, in that area, the one thing we've done in Jackson's diet is we've excluded dairy. Um, for the most part, he can have fermented dairy, but uh, 
just your regular old run-of-the-mill cow's milk has a very bad effect on his digestive system so we avoid that altogether. Um, we have considered removing gluten and also attempted removing gluten and um, I, I find it to be sort of terrifying <laughs> to start uh, to embark on that journey. Um, I want to and actually do plan to but at the moment it's not something we've started. I know when um, when Oliver's playing like it bouncing off the walls or at uh, Pappy's Pizza sometimes he will get real uh, overstimulated and we'll try to play with other kids try to grab them to pull him into his world uh, the things that I say to all uh, to the people I immediately go right up to the parents and I say you know my son is autistic he's deaf he doesn't understand boundaries and you know all he really wants to do in this moment is just play with your kid mm -hmm. he just doesn't understand how to play like your kid plays sure. uh, what kind of things do you do you say to people in those type of situations well first and foremost I I sort of um, gauge my reaction off of the parents reaction because Jackson is really not ever um, too rough with other children that's not usually the case um, but occasionally he does get too personal and and or does not understand why those kids don't want to play with him. He doesn't really get grabby and pull on their shirts or anything like that. But when Jackson meets new children, his instant response every time is, Mom, look at my new friends. That's what he tells me every time. And I love that about him, but also it is hard to see sometimes when those friends he's found are older children that don't necessarily want to interact with him. So if the parents are nearby, um, I will try and explain to them, you know, very briefly, this is why my little boy wants to play with, you know, your son or daughter so bad. And um, I sometimes get very understanding looks or sometimes I get very confused looks. Uh, I think it really depends on the parent. Um, interestingly about Jackson, I will get comments weeks later about a child he saw and met one time that he wants to go play with that friend again. He'll come up to me and say, Mom, I want to play with Emily again. And I don't know who Emily is, honestly, because she's not a child that I um, interacted with. But he will say, I want to play with Emily. And I'll ask, well, where did you see Emily? And he'll tell me where. And it was a place we haven't been for almost a month. So it's really hard to meet those needs. But yes, as far as parents go, I just try to be honest with them and, um, and explain in a simple but kind way of why my son is so curious about their children. Is there anything you would like to say or address, or was there a question you would like to answer that I did not ask? Um, sure. I will say that I think it's very important to check multiple resources when you're studying and doing your homework about your child. Um, I was just at a doctor's appointment for myself the other day, not for any one of my kids. But the questionnaire was very extensive. It was about, you know, genetic details and my family and all of that. And um, specifically, I was asked, do any of your children have any issues like Down syndrome or mental retardation? And I said, well, no, they don't. But my five-year-old is autistic. And the nurse looked at me and said, oh, so I should list that under retardation. This is a nurse. You know, she's, she's studied and gone to school. And I, and I said, no, in as kind and nice way as I could because she really doesn't understand. It's not retardation. They're not the same thing. And so I think it's important to remember that just because you're in a doctor's office does not mean you're going to run into exactly what you need to find out for your child. You've got to look all over the place and, and check all of your resources and never give up on your child just because you run into a roadblock or somebody who doesn't quite understand or um, can't help you right in that moment. Just keep looking, keep checking for more resources and, and keep trying. Thank you so much for your time.